Hello and welcome to the 2020 Filmmaker Forum presented by the San Francisco Dance Film Festival. This is an annual opportunity to, for filmmakers to share insight into their process and glean perspectives from others who share in their interest of creating dance films. Um, safe to say this year is a um, very odd year. Um, I don't like beating a dead horse, but it is a um, very unique year, particularly when it comes to creating dance film. Um, with a lot of dance film performances suspended, we're seeing a huge explosion in dance work that's being created and presented online. Uh, this year has also spelled new changes uh, when it comes to distributing film work and the way that we okay. sort of value the work that we create when there's being so much added to the internet milieu day by day. So this will be an open discussion um, surrounding questions that are pertinent to uh, dance filmmakers in this very, very unique year. But before we do this, um, I would actually like to go around the gallery and have each person, um, if they would like to, um, introduce themselves as well as their film and uh, the role that they have in the film. Okay, you can hear me, right? Yep. Oh, hi. Hey, I'm John Carluccio, director of Maurice Hines, Bring Them Back, a documentary about Mar uh, the dancer and superstar Maurice Hines. And uh, we're in the festival. Is there anything? Right? Cool. Yeah, Pete? Yeah, hi. My name is Pete Litwinowitz. Um, I'm in the Bay Area Shorts program. And uh, my film is uh, Daydreaming. I've acted as Director, editor, everything but choreographer and dancer. <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and call on people. Um, Irina? Hi, everyone. My name is Irina, and my film is Becoming. And I directed, shot, and edited the film. Excellent. And I want to mention that Pete's film is in the Bay Area Shorts program and Irina's film is in our Finding Me program. Um, let's see, Jing Chu. Hi everyone, my name is Jing Chiu Guan. I'm currently in Los Angeles. Um, my film's title is Family Portrait. I'm the director, choreographer, editor, and also one of the dancers in the film. Uh, and it's in the program uh, Finding Me. Nice meeting you all. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Kate? Hi. I just got audio, so I missed the early part, but I, I think you're asking just for us to identify ourselves and what we did with our film. So I'm Kate Mitchell, and my film is Golden. I um, directed and co-choreographed and um, designed the film. And one of the participants is here today, and that's Lindsay Gautier, who was uh, who edited the film so beautifully. <laughs> and my um, film is in Bay Area Shorts as well. Excellent. Um, let's see, is it uh, pronounced anime? Yes, anime is fine. Oh, anime, uh, okay. Hello, uh, my name is anime. Uh, I am the concept developer and choreographer of Reborn, which is a dance film part of the Finding Me program. And I'm currently based in the Netherlands in Europe. Hi, uh, I'm Suze or Susie, whichever you want to prefer, whatever you prefer, uh, Meisner, and I was the director, choreographer of the movie Bend, and I think it's in the short program? I don't know. Help me. Yep, it's in uh, Raising Voices. Raising Voices, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, Evie. Hi, I'm in Oakland, California, and... Um, my uh, film is called The Storm. It's a body music company, Motor Dance, and I'm the choreographer and artistic director, and I worked with Kind Motion Films to create the piece. Excellent. Oh, I'm uh, in the area shorts. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay Gautier. Um, I directed Last Dance in collaboration with Kevin uh, Jenkins and Heath Orchard. I directed, but we kind of came up with the project together and then Heath filmed it and Kevin choreographed it. And it's in the Bay Area shorts called Last, Last Dance. Nice. And uh, Aaron. 
Hi, um, I'm Erin Brown Thomas, and I've also gotten to uh, collaborate with Lindsay before. So, hey, Lindsay. <laughs> uh, we did a film on the ground last time, but the film that I have in this in this festival is a film that takes place in the air. Uh, um, so I'm the uh, director, co-creator, and co-producer of Human. It's an aerial dance film, and it plays in Dance Goes On shorts. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see, did I uh, get everybody here? All right. So let's... Um, so yeah, so once again, we have an incredible variety of filmmakers representing an incredible variety of films. And we, um, yeah, and many different types of films as well, from documentaries to uh, traditional screen dance. Um, and when our call opened in January 2020, um, I think it's safe to say that when it closed in May of 2020, we were looking at, it was like comparing apples to baseballs. We were looking at a very, very different time. And that was reflected in the films that we received. So um, we did receive quite a few works that were created during quarantine, but the majority of the film work that we saw or the majority of the film work that we received was intended to be screened in a cinematic setting on a big screen in the company of an audience. Um, so having uh, the work screen online does, in a sense, take the, that work out of context and sort of reappropriate it to another form. At the same time, this work now has the ability to reach a wider audience, and now uh, audience members aren't li limited by geographical location in order to experience um, incredible work. So what have been the positives and negatives of presenting your film uh, during this quarantine period? And uh, what have been, um, have there been any surprises when it comes to presenting the films then? Well, I'll speak if, if I'm not jumping in. Um, so for me, of course, it's been an incredible, um, sadness not to be able to be in a theater with audience members and and um, talking to people, you know, in the intermission and afterwards, and just to feel that direct connection with people, which I know we're all feeling, but especially when you've worked so hard to make a film, you just to get that uh, um, immediacy, the immediacy of response and connection with the audience is, it's sad for me. On the other hand, it is really great that um, it's available to a very wide audience and it's exciting to know that people from different countries can be watching the film and also it's very uh, it is as you said very convenient um, for people because they have the opportunity to watch not just on Sunday from seven o'clock to nine o'clock but also all week um, so uh, those are my main main takeaways, and they are kind of they, they kind of uh, sort of balance each other out. But I do have to say, I really miss the direct connection. Uh, Pete, oh Pete, you're muted. No, I know I I hit something and something else popped up. So you know, welcome welcome to the never mind. The wonderful world of Zoom. Um, you know, I, I, I iterate what uh, Kate said, but mainly I, I wanted to talk about it as an um, audience member. And I find uh, that I'm not giving, as much as I am a filmmaker, I'm not giving the filmmakers I'm watching the uh, attention that I would like to give. There's something about being caught in a theater. And I use the word caught in a good way. Um, uh, being forced to pay attention, which has a different um, uh, expectation from yourself as to how long you're going to sit, how long you're going to watch. Um, I'm not one to sit still at home. This is my personal view. And when I'm, when I'm in a theater, I have a completely different expectation. So for me, as a, as a, as a viewer, I find it, uh, I don't feel like I'm giving the films the respect and, and the attention they need, even though I'm, I'm trying desperately to do that. So that's all. Okay, Jing Tu? 
Yeah, I, I definitely iterate um, Pete in what Kate said, feel the same way. I feel, um, yes, I can access more films now. In the past, there are films I really wanted to see, but I didn't have access. Now I feel I'm, there is more films I'm able to watch, but yeah, I have a little kid at home as well. So it's just hard to give the full attention as a black space where um, everybody is sharing the space together and watching something in a concentrated manner. Um, yeah, so there's definitely a loss there and I really miss the gathering, but um, projecting to the future, I feel perhaps um, the quarantine time also showed us uh, maybe there are two formats can coexist in the future, maybe definitely having the in in person space, but also maybe there should be more possibilities to have it open to more wider audience. Yeah. And I saw um, Evie's hand up. Yeah, I was I was so excited because this was the first film festival that um, I knew I was going to be able to attend live. Very often they're in other parts of the country or I'm already booked somewhere else and I can't make it live. So here we were basically in my hometown and being able to show up live and get into the excitement of it. So I'm really sad that that's not the case. Um, I reiterate having people all over the world, but a silver lining has been that a uh, another festival, not a film festival, but a music festival in England uh, invited me to teach the vocabulary from my film um, Sunday morning, Sunday morning here. Um, just because of the publicity of being in the film festival and they wanted to learn the material. So it created a really interesting opportunity that I can do now live. <laughs> um, does anyone have anything they'd like to add to that? Yeah, uh, Animan. Thank you. Well, I'm always so impressed by how people from Northern America seem to speak so comfortably on, on, on screen. I'm a little bit more shy of this, but I'll try. Um, uh, what I really like, I add to the to what has been said before, um, it's been great to receive reactions from people over the world. Um, suddenly I had replies from people from Japan who I was like, whoa, <laughs> my film hasn't even been screened there, but they just got access to the film festival and um, sent me a reaction. But um that's been great what i also really have been enjoying is to see other people's films and in this weird reality where we're all locked up in a way we're in lockdown here again um to be at home and to see films of people that that yeah you know dance films that people made all over the globe and i find that so heartwarming to know that people you know take time and effort to create these beautiful constructs of art and that i over the internet can watch them and get inspiration from someone from romania or brazil or you know, San Francisco, which is, um, I find this a very hopeful and a very heartwarming experience. So that has been the, the positive side of it. Anyone else? Claire? Claire, just jumping back to what Jing Chi said, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, I think that what you said uh, is really um, very true about reimagining this dance film form for uh, screening at home and uh, appearing in live theater. And I'm, as I heard that, I was thinking about um, what kinds of material will be really exciting at home and will specific detail become more important when watching a film uh, or will we need to add, you know, flash or bells and whistles to capture people's attention at home, even though other things are going on, which sounds very um, trying to uh, move commercially, which I'm not, I'm not uh, advocating, but I think it's a really good thought process to begin um, because probably we will be going forward with a dual, um, a dual approach to presenting films. Um, well, I will move on to the next question, but before we do, uh, we had a few more people enter and I do want to make sure that um, each person's able to introduce themselves to the group. So, um, uh, Lisa, it's great to see you here. Uh, would you be able to um, introduce yourself and your film and your role in the film? Yes. Hi, um, sorry I was late. I couldn't find the link uh, and then Claire very kindly um, 
sent me the link. Uh, my name's Lisa Domarif. I'm the producer of Uprooted, um, The Journey of Jazz Dance, the documentary. Hi, hello everybody. Um, so I'm in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. Um, I'm an Argentine tango dancer and choreographer and I co-directed um, together with um, Pablo Destito, our short film that's called Bean. Um, Being is also in our Dance Goes On program. So um, moving on, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing an explosion of dance film work that's being made and primarily work that is uh, being made out of necessity. So we see a lot of dance companies that are creating virtual performances in lieu of uh, traditional, um, of actual like created choreographed uh, performance work. And we're also seeing um, a lot of dance festivals take a virtual festival format. Um, do you make any uh, kind of attempt to differentiate your, the work that you make from this other work that we're seeing? And what kind of challenges do you think that might present in the future? Uh, I will answer that one, but with a different topic a little bit, like that's correlated. So um, I feel, yeah, I, I think virtual performance versus dance film are two different things, like shooting something kind of as performance for video is a different thing, and I do both. So, um, but I see them as very separate most of the time. Uh, but what I'm finding is that, I mean, it's a good time to be a dance filmmaker, I guess, right now, because we're all probably pretty busy at the moment, or at least have the opportunity to be, to be busy. Um, at the same time, I think it's a struggle because I'm seeing that a lot of choreographers in, for necessity need to move into this realm haven't really like thought about how to move into the realm because they just haven't prioritized that for the all the years they've been doing this they've only been able to focus on their performance and that's the capacity that they are at and um and so wanting to jump in but also feeling the pressure to make something fast um and with with not much budget so that's what i'm kind of seeing is that there's this pressure that like oh everybody's doing dance film now i need to do dance film too wait, what am I doing? How do I collaborate? Okay, I need to get something for my donors like this year. You know, can you shoot something now for this much money? You know, that's kind of where everybody's at. And so I think it's important for us to start having conversations about how to connect as a community and support dance makers and figure out a nice process for how we can help without killing ourselves. Um, I've got lots of proposals to do things where I'm filming and shooting with like one helper you know, like with a, a camera assistant or something. And, you know, you can do one or two of those a year, but when you start doing those all the time, you're, yeah, it's, it's, it's exhausting and not as fulfilling. So that's kind of what I've been noticing. I'm curious what other dance filmmakers are encountering as you've been making your dance films and getting your dance films out there. If you, if you're getting similar requests or if I'm unique. Yeah. Um, Aaron, then Pete. Hi, um, can you guys hear me okay? I know my internet keeps saying it's unstable. <laughs> I apologize if I get strobe. Um, I think for me, you know, seeing more and more people do dance film and seeing kind of a weird blur between music video and dance film because there's people that are making music videos that are heavily danced, but then, you know, I've really been introduced to the screen dance genre, especially through this festival and seeing it different. But for me, every time I come back to an interest in making something dance, I keep asking myself, like, what is it that makes dance film special? And how do I use screen dance as, um, how do I let that shape my voice as a narrative filmmaker as well? Because I am also a narrative filmmaker, like I'm sure many of you are. Um, and I think, you know, so, um, Human, the film I have in this festival is is one from my company, Versal Assassins, which I share with the, the, the aerialist, Selkie Ham. We've made six films together. We're working on our seventh right now. And we've spent a lot of time talking about like our why and our, our brand and like what we want to say and what what makes us who we are. And the, the one of the things that we talk about is how we really love um, making making films that allow the viewer to extract their own meaning like that's one of the things that can be so powerful about dance 
Um, and, and I think you can still be, I think you can still solidly direct something and solidly tell a story, but still really invite the viewer to be creative with you. And so the, this influx of dance film in my life, whether it, I, I'm not aware if it's happening more in the world or if I'm just consuming more of it, but my own consumption of it increasing has really um, made me look at um, all media differently. Uh, I think a great example of that is I watched the OA this year that, you know, blends dance and filmmaking so seamlessly and um, it tells a story, but there are parts of this story that are more felt than understood, you know? And I, I think for me, all of the dance film that I'm consuming, it's becoming part of that conversation for me. It's how do you invite creativity in your audience and invite a real conversation because you can't watch a, a, a story like the OA without wanting to have a big conversation afterwards. So when I, when we put our work together, um, and yes, the OA is a television show, not a movie. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so when I'm, when I'm coming back to, to screen dance, I'm asking myself, am I simply just putting cool choreography on camera or am I raising questions, getting people thinking? Am I offering something that I have my own interpretation of it, but it, it, it encourages a further conversation and other perspectives. So I hope that kind of answers the question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you for that, thank you. And yes, definitely check out the OA if you haven't already. <laughs> um, uh, Pete. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> going, going back to the original question, um, uh, uh, of, uh, I, I'm a choreographer and a filmmaker. I have two different paths that have intersected in my life. And I ran a dance company for a while. And what I see, what I'm seeing right now is um, a lot of, I know a lot of people who run companies and they're rushing to get things to screen as Lindsay said, and I can see the proscenium dance and what they're doing. And I, I think it's a missed opportunity. I understand why they're doing it, right? They're doing it for, um, and some big companies, doing it for um, a donor attention, uh, audience retentions during this COVID time so they don't miss their audience and have them go on to do something else. Um, uh, on the flip side of that, the good thing is it, I kind of liken it, I'm an old um, geek. Uh, I worked at Apple in the, in the late 80s uh, during this whole publishing uh, explosion that happened that in your own home a lot of you were too young to remember that we didn't used to be able to do that and I see the tools that are available are kind of like um, the initial of uh, publishing software everyone's doing it because they can and then in five to ten years they're gonna learn what film language with dance language means to be together and so right now they haven't they haven't had they have the tools but they haven't learned the design um, that's I, I don't mean to sound so glib, but but it's kind of what I mean, and they will. Um, it's just it, it's right now that's not that's not what I see happening, um, but I think it will. Just a matter of learning. Would anyone else like to add to that? So what I wanted to uh, tag along on um, onto what Pete said is that the other thing that I'm noticing that I think maybe you don't experience as much if you're in a theater is how important it is for the dancers to really be rock stars and for the dancers to be, for lack of a better word, photogenic so that if we see um, connections, you know, um, uh, people dancers looking at each other, um, or, and interacting with each other, that it's not enough that they are performing the movements, um, that because it's because we're seeing the dancers on screen and we're seeing them on an intimate screen, you know, your computer or your laptop, or maybe you've got it connected to your big monitor, um, it, all of those little details are really come out very strongly. And I, I find that what what's going to need to have to happen is to consider how it is, how different it is for dancers to perform on a stage uh, than to per perform um, on screen. 
and that 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 kind of visceral connection between the dancers has to be very um, confident and it has to be very uh, nuanced and and rich um, for it to really have the same impact as um, a different impact but uh, um, a you know like a meaty impact as you would seeing it in the theater thank you um i'll go with uh lindsay and then pete yeah i was just gonna uh respond to what aaron said and say that um seeing dance come into the popular sphere through television and film right now has been incredibly inspiring and, and exciting to me I've wanted to move into feature film or narrative filmmaking for a long time. And I feel right now like super inspired and excited by that prospect and having ideas and trying to imagine how to make them become a reality. Um, but like this, this um, prevalence of it within the larger culture and the acceptance of it and interest in it is really exciting to me. And so I think um, I've, been try I've been doing some teaching in universities and high schools because now all of a sudden they're programs are like, oh my gosh, we have to, we have to work with our students in a new way because we can't do performances with them at the end of the semester, you know? So how do we get them, you know, accustomed to video? And I'm doing a lot, a lot of teaching around that. And um, I think it's really exciting to have, uh, to have that be part of dance training now, to have dancers actually getting to have media and film language as part of their learning I think it's super important in education and like if we do this like it will just kind of become part of everything so that it's you have as a dancer a choreographer coming into the world as a professional you can do both and whatever is necessary for you to promote yourself or your work or get build audience you'll have those tools so that's all i wanted nice uh pete yeah i, I won't try to bogart this uh, zoom meeting by talking all the time um I want to go back to what Kate said, which is, um, you know, one of the things I always counsel people who are dancers and in my own dance company is uh, the ability to be able to act. And um, I believe a lot of dancers um, are not trained to do that. I think that's a that's a problem in the dance world in particular that we, we, we often focus on technique and we don't focus on the human part of it. That's not across the board true, but I believe it needs to be more prevalent. But I also like, I like into what you say, instead of saying photogenic, I think of it more like, I know that's not what you meant per se. I think of it more like an acting um, gig, whether you're in the theater or on camera, um, you have to be able to have those interactions that are intimate without spraying it all over the place. Even if, even if you are acting on stage in a great way, it has to be bigger. Um, so I agree with what you say. I just think of it more of an acting skill and you're right. A lot of dancers don't have that, and you have to get them to be able to do that, especially in an intimate situation where you have a camera very close to them. Oh, uh, Lisa? Oh, you're muted. I, um, all I was going to say is uh, picking up from Pete, for me, I used to be a dancer and an actress, and now producing, and I could, I'm not a documentarian, I just happen to produce this documentary. Um, my first short film was all dance narrative. For me, you're a storyteller, so it has to be, you just have to be telling the stories, whether you're in movement or words. So as long as you're true to what you're, what you're saying, um, you're expressing, if you're telling the story and you're true and authentic to that, then that will read. And then if it's filmed be beautifully, then it'll always come across. And I think that's what's so powerful about dance is that our first film did so well and we, we had no words. It was just, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to say. And that's what I think is so beautiful about movement that you don't need words. Would anyone like to add on to that? Oh, Evie? Um, coming into this as a choreographer, it's always been really, it's because my company is kind of big um, which we need to get all the parts. It's really interesting to translate that um, onto, you know, dance for camera or screen dance or all the different words for it, because the impact that we have in a live performance is obviously 
you need to address it really differently to translate that to the screen. And it's a sort of a different approach. We're not, we're, we didn't start out intending to make films, but realized how much more we could, um, what a great reach we could have by uh, be, not being able to tour. But then here we are in this time. And I felt really strongly with the piece that we were working on that actually came up during this time that I wanted to put it on film, something we're working on right now, but I didn't want it to be a pandemic video, you know? And this is an interesting idea. Like, are we gonna wear masks? Are we not gonna wear masks? Do we wanna put this in this point of time? Um, it's, a, it's a huge moment in our history, in our global history. And the things that are coming out with masks on and what that says um, is, uh, and then the political situation as well. So it's really interesting creating right now. This isn't exactly the, the question, but I feel like we're in a position, especially having a large company of how to create a film that both puts us in this place and time, but doesn't necessarily read as we're all in these little boxes. <laughs> you know, we've seen it. We, we don't necessarily need to see more of people in their little boxes. I know we're all gonna be tired of that. You wanna have that real human connection and that cellular connection that I know is the thing that we're missing the most um, in our daily lives, but especially as artists. You know, when you are sitting in a, in a theater, even if you were sitting in the theater watching screen dance, you still would have a more cellular connection um, just by being amongst people. So how to create sort of that excitement, that energy um, without just making everybody feel sad. <laughs> so it's an interesting conundrum in creating new work in this time. Right, Erin, um, you have your hand up? Yeah, um, so I think that everything Evie just said makes a lot of sense and it, it touched on something that I've been thinking on a lot uh, regarding dance film. And that is, you know, the moment that we're in is not just the moment of being stuck at home, but I think over the course of the last decade, um, we've just seen our society become more and more polarized. I know, you know, I'm experiencing that in the United States and I, I have no doubt that it's happening a lot of places due to the availability of people just putting their opinion out there very quickly, lots of like thoughts, 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 without a lot of empathy. It's just very easy with the red, how readily available social media is, but um, in the 24 hour news cycle and all that. But one of the reasons that I think dance film is really powerful is, you know, we can't rely on simple fixes in our society to, to bridge, bridge the gap. Um, there's, and for like so many people, there's an entire shift in perception and paradigm that's needed. And people don't just shift that way overnight. The weight of the weight of that, it has to be experienced internally. And so a dance style, it allows an audience to personalize things that otherwise might feel like messages in a way that's not dictated, but is guided, which encourages and cultivates that shift of perception that begins with feeling. Right on. Uh, would anyone like to add anything to that? All right, so, um, so safe to say it's uh, quite challenging creating work during this time. And specifically, um, as I, I think Evie said it beautifully, like do you necessarily want to create work that uh, is a ref as a reflection of this time, uh, created sort of like in these formats that we typically see. Um, but nevertheless, without um, read readily being able to access dancers or crew members or um, some in some cases, even equipment, um, dance film creators have to be very um, creative. And sometimes these limits can inspire a sense of creativity. So how have you been able, if you've been able to create work during the pandemic, how have you been able to do it? And have you made any interesting discoveries by doing so? Let's go with uh, Anamin. Yes, I'll give it a go. Um, in the Netherlands, we had a rule uh, from March on that you as a dancer need to have one and a half meters of distance, the social distancing, also on stage. Uh, so this kind of made it impossible to make a group piece and I had an idea in my mind 
and decided to have one dancer uh, performing and then the other dancer not physically being there but only being there with her voice so we hear a voice as the audience and then the male body on stage is interacting with this um, so it is a duet actually they do interact um, but her body is just not there uh, and this was a, a very a good fit like this concept fit really well into the rules of the of the government that we had so uh, by making these adjustments um, we were still able to to continue and to um, uh, to develop work it's not a it's not necessarily dance film work um, it's a stage work but um, this is a it's a concept that was a it was a bit of a of an accident that it came to this but in the end it also turned out to be a solution and the only the only reason why you could keep on working so um, it was a it was a journey, but it was interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm curious to hear about the others because uh, if you have solutions, please tell us. So I'm very curious. <laughs> yeah, Pete, I think I saw your hand up as well. Yeah, but if anybody wants to go first, I'm happy to. I'm happy not to talk again. <laughs> so in March, uh, uh, me and me and the person I work with very, a lot as a choreographer, Liz Roman, here in the in the, uh, San Francisco. Um, actually did some work where we had uh, dancers film themselves in their own spaces. And this was when I thought, and we both thought that um, the virus would be done maybe by summer. I mean, you know, we, we didn't know anything in March. Um, and now that things have progressed to where it is now, you're not going to like my answer, <laughs> which is um, I've decided not to make work because um, I like people touching. I like people interacting, even if they're not touching. I like the camera to do interesting things and not be set up, you know, uh, across the room or outside on a tripod. Um, so uh, I haven't thought of, I have some creative ideas, but frankly, I, I'm not interested much like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, my glasses, uh, Evie said, I'm not interested in making COVID um, period work anymore. I did it for a month and I'm kind of done with that waiting. For, I have some great ideas for when this is all over and I have hope for when that happens and I'm willing to wait. That's all. Cool. Uh, Aaron? Yeah. Um, well, I've, so Selkie and I made one more screen dance film um, during COVID with um, a very a group of five people that had, you know, were germ pod buddies together, I guess. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I share Pete's sentiment in that it's, I also, you know, love close contact and love being able to uh, improvise last minute and had the freedom of not having to worry about COVID. And I think part of, part of that response is why I've spent so much time writing and developing. But I think if it, there is one potential, there's probably more than one, but one potential um, asset, I guess, of this time is, you know, in general in life, limitation sometimes makes you have to be more creative. And I think if you think of it in terms of limiting the number of people involved, um, especially, I mean, you know, if you need like 30 extras for a concept, that's one thing, but if, if you can do something with just a few people and if you can keep specifically your crew smaller, there is something to be said for, um, the creativity that can sometimes come by, by something being a smaller production. An example of that is, you know, our technology is getting more and more capable of, um, great images with, you know, even like an iPhone. And I actually produced a micro budget feature this past year that was shot on an iPhone. And I remember with that, it was so exciting to be able to have, you know, only a few minutes between setups uh, for, because I mean, in a lot of my narrative work, I'll go a half an hour between setups, like and actors will just be sitting around. And I think that can translate into dance too, where if we just say, you know what, in this time, people are now watching TV shows that are shot on people's like SNL did like at home, right? Like I think there's this appetite for people who realize that production value doesn't make something entertaining. It might make something beautiful, but it doesn't make something entertaining. And so this scaled down thing where people have the freedom, they're not spending thousands of dollars on a camera, they have their iPhone. So they're they're like, you know, what if we tried this weird angle? 
hey, we got time for it because we're not spending an hour on a lighting setup. So what I think this period of time for is like an incubator time, right? Like we're in, like, I think of it as like, we are incubating. We are taking the time to try new things, to do things low risk because there's not this huge pressure on us for things to look like they were shot by Roger Deakins, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think of that taking that pressure off is kind of beautiful. Yeah, that's so beautifully said. And I mean, if you don't mind me adding something before, um, I'll, I'll let Evie go next, but um, this time is really sort of, yeah, level the playing field almost in a way that so many people can, you know, make work and have that work be seen as well. Um, so uh, Evie? Um, yeah, um, yes, leveling the playing field is one amazing thing about, uh, you know, everyone's kind of in the same space, but also every, uh, you know, the market's getting glutted with people now creating things that maybe you created and they didn't. Um, but when, when the lockdown came, we were about to premiere a new work. And so, you know, everything shut down for a little bit and then we went to rehearsing on Zoom. And then because of where we live, uh, everyone wanted to be outside and say, can we meet outside? Can we please meet? And my company was just, I was like, what are we doing this for? I don't even know. I'm not feeling creative. I, I'm not really sure how to go on with this, but they needed the, you know, just to be able to gather far apart, masked and dance together. And it was saving everybody's souls to be able to do at least a little bit of what they were used to doing. Um, because we create our own soundtrack. Um, it's a moving choir, so we're singing, we're doing body percussion and all of that. Um, it was very interesting to, and I was moved by a new piece of music and created something new. So I will say I've mostly not been feeling super creative during this time, but something came up and I jumped on it and they wanted to do it. And everybody just had this like, please, can we have something, you know, to like hang our hats on. I still, is it good? relative to the greater world or just this time or whatever but as with all art trying not to get hung up on the details but just continue moving forward with it but I was going to say the same thing Aaron said about realizing the capabilities of my phone <laughs> and the fact that people could re record relatively like not very good audio even that we could mix it in a way that sounds great and sounds pretty natural and just sort of the ingenuity of re you know just turning the corner and as as a freelance artist i mean that's like the entirety of our careers is or as artists in general you know making a turn here making a turn there you lose your funding you get a grant you know everything is like it's not set in stone so this is i'm kind of excited about the shakeup you know of i'm a little uh a little bummed out about the glutting of content you know that there is that it's really easy for things to get lost and yet it is exciting um just finding new ways to create but like i was saying just not wanting to to create <laughs> or having that um dichotomy of moment specific not moment specific like you great art you want it to live on and be uh, appropriate beyond its moment um, possibly. So um, just, and even within that, even in my company, some people were like, you know what, I'm ditching for, I'm leaving the area for three months. Um, or we can't be outside now because the air is filled with smoke. And so like every moment, like as opposed to where we used to plan really far out, now we're kind of planning day by day and things are shifting so quickly and yet so slowly at the same time. And it's kind of fascinating. Like if you really sort of can take a step back from panic or dismay, it's fascinating to observe the shifts. And I feel like artists such as all of yourselves have are sort of the most capable of shifting with the tides. Um, Aaron, would you like to add anything to that? Just something real quick. Um, Evie brought up the idea of um, how there's just so much noise out there and, and asking ourselves, well, and how it's, it's easy to put something out there and get lost because there's so much stuff out there. Um, 
And I think that is, so I'm an, I'm an extrovert. I'm an external processor. I'm not the kind of person who like very naturally makes something and hides it. You know, I know there are people who really sit on genius works and are afraid to put them out in the world. But I think one of the tough things about the world we live in now is we're all becoming more and more used to the idea of living with an audience because again, bringing it back to social media and bringing it back to the availability of like growing an audience. And I mean, as an artist, like an audience is a weird way of like defining your worth, which is a whole other discussion, whether that's a good or bad thing. But I think one of the challenges, again, getting back to like thinking of this time as a period of incubation, the, the, for some people, not for all, but for people like me, I think the challenge is to allow it to be something just for me when it's supposed to be and to know when it's time to put something out there. Um, because I think we have a responsibility, like in noticing there's a lot of noise in the world, there's a lot of things competing for our attention. There's this, I think, mandate for us to ask ourselves every time we put something out, like, am I adding to the noise? Am I, am I putting something out there that will distract from something that should be seen? Or am I putting something out there that should be seen? And I think there's too much pressure on us to create masterpieces every time we pick up a camera or we, you know, do a pirouette or whatever it is. And um, just being able to go back to the place of play and uh, try to remember what it's like to not have an audience or to do something simply for ourselves. I think that is a hard thing to remember in this moment. Um, but possibly a really important one. Nice. Uh, Jing Chu, I think you had your hand up. Yes. Um, yeah, I just want to add on what has been said. I really uh, reiterate what Aaron said about, you know, under restrictions, right, when, when there's limitations, especially as dancers, a lot of times when we choreograph, right, or we always give us limitations, and out of that, there's possibilities that emerge. Uh, so for me, per for me personally, you're, during this time, I'm mostly focused on editing some works that's been shot before and also doing pre-production for the next film. But uh, I'm also teaching a class at UCLA on, on film and all my students are dance majors. And so uh, in the past when I taught the class, um, you know, the assignments are really different. Um, now, they, most of them only does, do not have any roommate. They live alone and everybody has different comfortability about, you know, how much they want to go outside or interact with people. So I had to really adjust the assignment um, in, Mo all of them don't have access to equipments anymore, so they really only have a phone. Um, but I think what is the most important is intentionality, right? I think any medium has their advantages, and it doesn't mean you always need to have, you know, a red camera. Sometimes you really need the quality of a phone to create the film you want, right? Each camera has its purpose for different medium. So I think encourage your students to really think very carefully and intentionally about why do you use this medium? What is this medium is most suitable for? What kind of film is it really um, most suitable to create by using this, right? And if you only have natural light or light in your home, how can you um, be very mindful of how to set the lighting, choose the time of the day? Um, so like in the past, I would have them do one shot exercise um, to film movement, but now they can't. So I just change assignment to create self portrait and be very intentional about how do you compose the image, even if the camera has to be on tripod or make stop motion um, animations, right, to create movement that way. So I think uh, there are ways to continue create and be very intentional about the choices we make. Nice, I think I always reiterate the Maya Darren quote that, you know, cameras don't make films, filmmakers make films. Yeah. So, uh, Lindsay, did you have something you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I love what I'm hearing from everyone. And it's funny because it's actually reminding me of things that I've forgotten about in this crazy time of like so, so many things coming and trying to sort how to do everything and getting in under the stress of that. Um, after going for a long period of time with nothing happening, it's like um, this time has been very interesting and the, like the little bit of a roller coaster that it is. But, um, you know, I even speaking before about um, smaller crews or no crews and just going and shooting things and being outdoors. So not worrying about the lighting setups and all of that. It actually kind of is this really exciting time where you get to kind of go back to the basics and think about how to not focus on the technology and focus more on the content 
and, and to, to make that kind of the priority. So I feel like that's kind of the benefit of this moment in time. And it's what's inspiring to me and what this even conversation has kind of inspired me just in the last few minutes is like, oh, right. Like I should, I'm excited about that. Like I actually am excited about that. I'm excited about going with one camera and maybe a helper and just being with the dancers and letting the things evolve the way that I did when I first started doing this. So um, I, yeah, I reiterate there, there's always like benefits to the limitations and we just have to remember them and connect with them and then embrace them. So, yeah. Is it okay if I chime in? Does someone else want to speak? Oh, um, yeah, go, oh, Kate then Pete. Okay, well, uh, Kate and Pete can dovetail because I wanted to say, um, I get to echo what Lindsay said, all of this, um, all of you filmmakers are really giving me a lot of inspiration and food for thought because like Ben, um, once this uh, new period began, I felt I was just stopped in my tracks and I felt, well, I don't know, what should I do? And I, I, um, I started working in another arena, which is also very meaningful to me, and that's uh, making sculptural couture uh, and just feeling like, okay, film, what? Um, so all of these thoughts are really inspiring. I did, I did, um, I did have a few questions though, and one is for Ben. So if you've decided to, um, to not make film right now, are you working on other projects? And then to our other um, filmmakers, um, I love the idea of thinking small, but I'm also thinking about light and sound and how to, um, if not control it, how to, um, uh, work with it so that work with them so they are your friends. For instance, right now there's a lot of construction going outside my window. Hopefully you can't hear it, but if that's a factor that's beyond my control. And then the last thing that I um, that you brought to my mind is I'll be so curious to see what kinds of films are going to be shown in next year's festivals. Um, when you said Ben, did you meet Pete? I'm just curious. Um, yeah, I have lots of interests too. So um, while I'm not making dance films, I'm on my decks doing time lapses of the city and clouds and um, birds and it's just for me. So um, I just wanted to say even before quarantine lockdown, I'm, I'm probably the, the rogue filmmaker here. I shot everything on GoPros and um, iPhones. And the reason for that is not because I like the limitation. It's actually the freedom of being able to be in a small room with somebody. And so if I don't have the lighting I like, I can, I'm a visual effects um, developer, so I can often change it. Or what I'll do is instead of moving the light, because shooting on such devices means you have to have natural light, um, I'll move the dancer to get a shadow or, 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 or a fill that I want. Um, so I'm just, the, I don't like to move furniture either. So I like to have the rooms be as um, uh, uh, every day as normal. Uh, it's just my thing. And uh, so uh, I've been shooting on very small devices because it allows me the freedom. I don't think of that as a um, negative at all, except that I can't shoot in low light, which is, that's the only, I do wish I had a, a, a small camera that I could do low light really well. That's all I had to say. Right, right. So we are um, just past the top of the hour. So uh, we'll wrap things up um, pretty shortly here, but I wanted to present one final question. So um, Aaron actually mentioned that we are sort of like in a glut of content. There's so much out there and everything that was going to be presented in another setting has somehow migrated on here. And I would like to ask all of you um, from, Lisa and John who have major documentaries that were created for you know, cinematic screenings and eventually cinematic distribution, as well as everyone else, how does that affect the way that you're distributing your work? How does that affect the way that the processes of, um, of submitting your work to festivals and putting, on, putting your work online goes? Like what, um, how has that shifted during this time?
I can answer if you want. Is that okay? Go for it, yes. Um, so it forces us to be like more selective about what film festivals we go into because um, we, want, we don't want to spread ourselves out too thin with virtual streaming. And we've gotten advised that, you know, you don't want to, you, you want to sort of limit as much as you can um, your, your footprint, you know? Um, but at the same time, you want, you know, to build an audience, you want to build press, you want to do all that. So we've been really selective to pick, you know, uh, films that will support the project. So that's kind of how we've uh, dealt with the virtual world. Although we, you know, like, like was said earlier, and we really, I really appreciated hearing was how you miss this, you know, the physical world <laughs> so much. But, um, but there has been some, you know, you know, you reach a lot more people uh, all of a sudden, or people that couldn't get to it. So it's, uh, it's, you know, has its give and takes. Excellent. Um, Aaron, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think this is sort of timeless in that, you know, different, different pieces of art all should be distributed in different ways that make the most sense for what that piece of art is. Right now, I have a feature and four shorts on the festival circuit, and I'm treating all of them differently. Um, three, uh, three of the shorts are screen dance, and I mean, one of which is pretty much at its end. It's the one I worked on with Lindsay. Um, but then I have two of these versatile assassin shorts, um, a comedy, a comedy short and a, a drama fantasy feature. And each, like the drama fantasy feature, you know, there's, we're doing traditional distribution. Um, we'll be on, you know, Amazon soon. Um, the comedy short is more, more along the lines of what I used to do with all of my shorts, where it's, I wait for some sort of I don't know, like sexy publication to pick it up, like whether it's No Budge or Vimeo staff pick or something like that. Um, but I found with the, the, the more niche my stuff is and not just niche, but like the more rare, I guess, like this particular, you know, this stuff I do here, aerial screen dance. I think what I've noticed is that you can audience, the more specific your voice is, the more you can truly audience build online um, and find your evangelists, the evangelists of your art. And so we've had a lot of success with the Versatile Assassins films. That's the company that I make my aerial screen dance films through. We've had a lot of success through YouTube. When we posted, we've you know posted a, a couple of our films over the last two years. This one, after posting it, we're up to over 60,000 subscribers on YouTube because people are just very excited because of this very niche, niche thing we do. So, I mean, I would just to anyone listening, if you have something really niche, I think that, um, and if you're looking not necessarily just to make a ton of money right now, but you're looking to build an audience, which could lead to opportunities where you could get real financing to make something bigger. I mean, that's sort of my end game with all of this and to enjoy the process, of course. But YouTube and um, whether it's YouTube, Vimeo, or even you know Facebook Watch, whatever, wherever you find, you know, my audience is really young. So YouTube is more ideal than Facebook Watch for me. Um, but it, it's, it's really wonderful. And it's nice because I've had the opportunity to really interact with our audience too, because they're giving us comments. Um, we have the ability to, there's like a, their community page that YouTube has. So I'll put like polls out. Just, I mean, they don't even have to be related to dance, but it'll be like, hey, where are you guys tuning in from? Or, you know, how has this pandemic affected you? What is the thing you miss the most? Things like that. I think that the sort of insights that you can gain about the people who appreciate your art are so helpful. And if there are ways that you can distribute your work where you're also gaining insight about who your audience is, um, I don't know, it's been really fun and I'm finding it really helpful in um, kind of planning how to leverage it all for long-term growth. Uh, Lisa, okay, at the end, there you go. Just um, off of John as well, cause we've got a great festival liaison. So we were advised 
And we strategically picked our festivals. And so whoever selected us, we were kind of strategic this year because um, we didn't, you kind of want to build your audience, get, get the reviews. So the distributors are happy, but not unhappy because you've had too much exposure. So um, there are some festivals that invited us. So we had to geo block to just the state. Um, cap their tickets so we didn't over oversell kind of thing but at the same time we've built our audience quite well quite um, organically which has been great um, we've only done two dance festivals and then the rest have been you know either doc fests or other fests and um, so it's been a really nice kind of cross and we'll 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 do festivals till about March and then we'll distribute but um, we'll release next year and it will be general release and we're doing an educational package because obviously there's there's both it, it appeals to both so we have all the plans going on so yeah and that's what we're busy i i have no time to do more content right now <laughs> we're kind of busy doing that so yeah oh would anyone like to add on to that i'll say something and that is that I feel very humbled being in this fabulous group because I'm a first time filmmaker. It's a very small film. Um, and I, so therefore I don't have any experience about how to uh, offer and where to offer the film. I, my film Golden is um, a film that's been of interest to some dance festivals, but I decided that uh, it might be also of interest to uh, women's film festivals and some international film festivals. Uh, and um, that I've had a lot of success with. So then I perhaps I've, I've uh, you know, uh, over, um, overshared, but I feel that my, um, my film is so, um, I don't want to say so small, but since it's um, um, I'm not working at the level that many of you are, it seemed um, it seemed the right thing to do. And obviously, I've learned a lot over this year. Um, the other thing, working on this small, specifically dance level, I um, I had been applying to a variety of festivals, and then by um, you know by June, I realized this is just not happening this year. And so um, I stopped applying to festivals. Um, some of the festivals I applied to and uh, have decided to postpone the entire thing till 2021. So we'll see what that's like. But um, my, so my ultimate choice was to, to step back uh, out of the uh, submitting to anyone in the, any festivals um, in the circuit. Let's see, uh, anybody else? Oh, yeah, Nina, yep. Yes, okay. Yeah, well, um, this is my first experience too as a, as a co-director. Um, we, I, I feel very, yeah, very happy that we've been accepted in many different festivals. We offer, we, we apply for different international festivals and we've been selected um, by 12 already, so we've been in different countries, but it's true. Uh, in, in my case, I think it was, um, well, it was a very different year for everybody, and I'm in Argentina, and I don't think I, will, I was able to travel to any of these festivals, and opportunities like this one is, is great for me, that it, it, it's an asset that uh, brings the, the COVID that many different Zoom activities were, uh, proposed by different festivals and they were open uh, and streaming. So it's true that that changed a little bit the situation in terms of uh, we had to cancel one or, or two festivals because of the streaming possibilities. It opens the audience um, of everybody and so it changed a little bit the situation. But I wanted to ask you um, if you had any advice of any different channels of distribution after these festival circuits that I'm not aware of for dance, for short dance films. Right, well, actually that's a, a good transition to something else I wanted to mention that I'm also actually a custodian of the screen dance calendar that 
um, basically promotes these um, other dance film events and other dance film screenings and educational opportunities. Um, I will actually go ahead and link that in the chat, right, um, assuming I have the right page. Um, or I can even share it through uh, the Facebook page, but it's a, it's a calendar that is a um, compilation of open calls and other online dance film events that are ongoing as well. So um, there are quite a few of them going on and um, I certainly encourage everybody to take advantage of it. So um, yes, I'll go ahead and post the link here. Let's see. Yeah, so here's the screen dance calendar. Um, and I will also, um, this, uh, as I mentioned, this event will be posted um, following, uh, and I will also uh, include that calendar in the show notes there as well. So, um, but yeah, but thank you everyone so much for um, taking the time to join us today. And I know it's um, a very strange, world that we find ourselves in right now, but at least I found personally that this has also been an opportunity to connect with so many different people from all around the world. And again, geography, geography is not a barrier anymore and we can really, um, re really share our practice in a new way. So um, thank you. Yeah, chime in. Oh, go for it. Yeah, go yeah. for it, Kate. Um, thank you so much, Claire, for hosting this. And it's been really fantastic to, um, to have a conversation with you all, um, filmmakers. Um, it's been, you guys are really smart and have great ideas and it's been really exciting. So thank you for that. The last uh, forum I participated in was in Buenos Aires, all in Spanish. And uh, so I, I missed a lot of it. So this is really fantastic, so thank you. Um, hey, um, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, I can hear you now, yep. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I've been trying to talk for a while now. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to properly introduce myself. Um, hello, hello everyone. My name is Alonso, I'm the director of Amen. Uh, and I'm just want, I just wanted to say that I'm, I feel so grateful to be here. Uh, this is a fantastic group. This is the first time that I've ever applied to a festival and this is obviously the first time I got chosen. <laughs> So I feel very excited and it's just like a great experience uh, to hear all of you, to hear your input. You're all very talented, cre creative, uh, smart people and I just feel grateful uh, to be here. So thank you everyone. Thank you so much Alonso and we're so grateful to have your film at the festival as well. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, stay safe out there. Um, keep making work, and yes, um, please do connect people uh, with others. Um, oh, I, can I actually make a file of this chat? Okay, yeah, I'll make. Um, I'll see if I can copy the chat and also send it to everybody who is here as well, just so you have the contact information and contact links as well. So, but yeah, I encourage you to connect and um, keep the keep the conversation going. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Claire. This has been such an honor. Oh, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Susan. We're so happy we could include Ben in the festival as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, Ben is, ben is awesome. Oh, thank you. So beautiful. Like, it's so funny. I didn't know it was a dance film. And then I was like, oh, this is a dance film. <laughs> 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 There's no difference, right? It's just <laughs> there is no difference. Yeah, that's what we want eventually, right? Everyone to think that dance is language. Exactly. It is. Yeah. It is. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much. You're brilliant. And I've been inspired to, to make something new just listening to all of you. Because I've been like Pete, like not wanting to do anything. So thank you so much <laughs> for sharing this. Well, lovely to meet you all. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye.